All right, so um, I guess we'll go ahead and just get started. Uh, my name is Ben Howard. I am a software engineer um, with Canonical, and I'm on the Cloud Ecosystems team. My primary job from day to day is I build the uh, Ubuntu images for EC2, Windows Azure, HP Cloud, all those guys. Um, and so uh, I have plenty of experience with uh, playing in the cloud. Um, and what I'm going to talk about t today is um, when, when we start talking about going to the cloud, there's all sorts of problems that come with it. Um, and you have everything from you know the, the typical thing of how do you manage it, how to keep the inventory, how to keep the life cycle, how do you make sure that you have the configuration management, patch management, deployment services set up, all that sort of stuff is um, things that have been well defined and solved in the physical space, but when it comes to the cloud, we're still having emerging technologies. Um, and so how many of you guys do anything in the cloud? You guys, anything new or? So, um, so kind of when, when you think of the cloud, the one when this is something that my, my, my brothers who are all in computers, or all the Howards males, use something in computers. Um, we got two who are computer scientists, two of us are IT, and one's an auditor. Um, and uh, whenever we get together, invariably my sister will say, "What is the cloud?" And it will start off the most contentious argument um, because it seems like everybody has a different definition. What I like to refer to the cloud is, is it's an abstraction. It takes um, what you used to think of um, in, uh, you know, the classical computer or IT installation is that if you were to go and ask someone, show me your, uh, your database server, they might take you down to you know, some closet somewhere and, and point to a machine and say, this machine is my database server. Um, and uh, they might tell you that it has 16 gig of RAM, it has two terabytes of hard disk, um, and it's a Dell server. What the, what the cloud, you know, when it comes to compute nodes, all that stuff doesn't matter. All you care about is maybe where it's run and that you have an IP address. It becomes this abstraction. Cloud is also a way of where to store stuff. Cloud is a, a, a way of approaching things. But more importantly, um, when it comes to the difference between a cloud versus a non-cloud, I think the difference is that the cloud gives you an API to be able to interface with it. Um, and so uh, uh, the, generally, if, if I don't see an API that I can feel, that I can touch, that I can read, to do things from provisioning, lifecycle management, I don't really consider it a cloud. It's a virtual uh, hosting provider, uh, you know, kind of like a VPS or something along those lines. But the cloud creates a whole bunch of headaches. And so what I want to talk about today is a couple of them. And that is deployment and service setups, um, and, and a little bit about the management. Um, so, how many of you guys have deployed a cloud service at all? Fired up an EC2 instance. Um, yeah. So, um, yeah, you guys have like like a VPS provider, or uh, any of you guys done any sort of things like uh, uh, where you rent a uh, virtual machine somewhere? Yeah. So, so one of the things. Um, about it is that it's always a pain because the first thing you, you do when you get this in this machine is you have to log in and then you got to do stuff you got to set up users you, maybe you want to uh, put new SSH keys maybe you need some new packages um, so Canonical um, has worked on two different technologies and I'm going to talk about them the first one's not really all that sexy but it makes your life a lot easier and that's called clouding it um, and it's basically boot time provisioning uh, for cloud-based systems using simple rules. So when you go to start an instance in EC2, you get this little pane that says user data. And if you've ever wondered what that is, user data is just an uh, arbitrary blob of data that you can drop and stuff and say, eh, here, go do something interesting with it. Um, and CloudNet handles um, the provisioning um, so that um, unlike some, of our, uh, some other images, what Ubuntu does is what the cloud images that are uploaded to all the clouds, it has no identity, it has no keys, nothing. It's a blank image that has never actually physically been booted ever. Um, and what CloudUnit does is using the metadata from the cloud um, and your user data, it can make that image something interesting. So let's go to, um, you know, this basically just kind of tells me about it. But the big thing is, is that it's a simple YAML. Uh, why YAML? Because it's easy and it's human readable. Um, but this would be a simple example. So, like, I use, I'm a, I build cloud images. So this is actually from, you know, embellished a little bit. But this is actually one that I use. 
Um, yeah, so basically, I say I want to install Bazaar because I like Bazaar. Um, get Bootstrap, maybe some some other tools, and then I want to run some commands. And these commands can be as arbitrary as you want. Um, then maybe they can be to uh, install um, Chef or Puppet. And in fact, um, the Chef or Puppet configuration, it can using CloudyNet, you can actually have it hook into your Chef or Puppet installation for you. So that all you have to do is fire it up and you get your config management taken care of. The, the difference between this and Chef, and Chef and Puppet is that unless you spin your own images, which if we would like to refer to that as Ami Soup or Amazon Machine Image Soup, it's a real pain and you hate doing it And because um, someone has to do it. This basically, you could use this to um, hook things into your infrastructure without having to do anything. Um, uh, maybe a, a different example. Maybe you need to. Maybe your your organization requires different users, um, and it can handle the creation of a user, including the implementation of SSH keys. So um, uh, we also have worked with top distributions to make sure that this goes everywhere. Uh, everybody from um, you know even Amazon Linux adopted it. And the reason they went with it was because it was so easy to use. Uh, and if you run things like uh, some Amazon services like Elastic Load Balancer, um, I'm sorry, not Elastic Load Balancer, Elastic Beanstalk, um, and their ops code use CloudyNet to be able to configure the instances. All right, so that's kind of CloudyNet. CloudyNet's not nearly as sexy as what I want to talk about now, um, which is um, Juju. You guys heard of Juju at all? And what have you heard about it? Um, it's basically a way, it's sort of like Puppet and Chef, where it, you can just sell what you want to do into what they call charms and deploy services based on. So, so you, you're, 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 you're really close. Okay. The difference is, is that um, Chef and Puppet are config management, and uh, Juju is um, a service orchestration. And I'll get more into that. So let's use a hypothetical situation that your boss comes up to you and says, I've heard about this whole thing about big data and how Hadoop is really awesome, and um, I need a Hadoop um, installation by the end of the day. Um, and so you decide, all right, fine. So you get out there, and you go to the Hadoop wiki, and you take a look at this. And your first reaction is, OK, um, all right, I can get it from you know, all this sort of stuff, and then you start seeing all these commands, and you start getting a little bit confused, and you're like, man, this this just doesn't work. Um, okay, well, what, what what else do we have? Oh, geez, we got more stuff, and we got more stuff, and we have even more stuff, and oh man, uh, getting it done by the end of the day, it's not going to happen. There is a better way. What Juju can do, and I kid you not, in three commands, you can have an Hadoop cluster set up. What um, Juju charms are um, is basically, we call it DevOps distilled, where we have, uh, go out and we work with uh, various subject matter experts to take what they know best and to distill them into a charm, which is just the, basically a set of scripts that describe how to do something. Um, and Juju manages services, not machines. And what, one of the things with the cloud is you kind of have to think about it. You don't care about, in the cloud, there's a, there's a different way of thinking. Um, when you have a problem with a machine in the cloud, most people will just throw that machine away. It's not worth troubleshooting. The machine has no identity. You have no capital investment other than the data. So if the, the thing is having problems, it is faster for you just to rip it out and simply put something new in and point it to your data. The difference is, is, is uh, amazing when you start to think about it because now instead of your system admins uh, or developers worrying about trying to figure out how to troubleshoot that weird application and looking through stack traces, you can just throw it away. Go fire up a new one, point it at your data, and you're done. And uh, in the cloud, when I was working at Amazon, what we would see is that it was actually kind of frustrating from an uh, OS perspective because people would say, oh, it, it, it blew up, um, and here's a stack trace. And we'd go back to them and say, yeah, well, can we have you do something, you know, maybe do some troubleshooting? And the most common response is, I threw it away. It wasn't worth my time. 
It's faster for you to not worry about the machine. You want to worry about your service. And so as people start building up to the cloud, one of the problems is, is that we're talking about scale out instead of you know, scale up. And so if you need a new machine to do something, um, you can scale your service out and you don't care about what the actual physical computes are. You only care that your service is running on how many nodes or that your service is um, working well enough. So what Juju is, is that we are going to care about the service. And so we call that service orchestration. And what you'll see is that um, over the course of computing, we first started out with hardware and trying to figure out you know, how to do simple things. Um, and then we went up and we started worrying about the operating system. And once we got the operating system really figured out, we said, hey, we can do this thing called virtualization, do it really, really cool. And then someone came out and we said, eh, well, we also need config management because we had all of a sudden we had this proliferation of new machines that happened. And then service uh, orchestration is one step above it. And um, I, I didn't wear my shirt because my wife didn't want me to wear it in Utah. But we have this thing where basically of you know the uh, evolution of, of man where you have you know a monkey all the way and it goes to the terminator. Um, and the terminator is the service orchestration where we are moving to where the average user or developer or system admin cares very little about what's underneath um, the service. You need to run a Drupal site, you, can, you worry about being an expert in Drupal and the content that you put into it. If you want to run a Tomcat installation, you worry about your war files, not about Tomcat. Um, and that's the, the, the fundamental shift that Juju is introducing. So the question is um, exactly, you know, what I've talked about so far isn't all that kind of you know, special. Everybody's going to be like, well, okay, what do you do? You have um, uh, you know, service management, but that doesn't really make a whole bunch of a whole lot of sense. What Juju, the magic behind Juju is that you can bring up discrete units, um, and let, let's say, for example, your your lamp stack, um, or actually, we'll go back to our Hadoop uh, example. As part of the the bootstrap, you got you have a Hadoop master and you have a Hadoop slave. You got to get those two talking. So what the charms do is they, they uh, talk about, or you define interfaces, where the Hadoop master, you can just simply with one command, get them hooked up. Um, and that is, um, so any, any questions so far? So I guess where you, where you run, go back to that other slide. Um, so you're doing Juju Bootstrap, and then deploy Hadoop master. I mean, is that all running on the same machine, or is that then going out and building? Well, um, so for, for the bootstrap, it goes and creates a bootstrap node, which is basically your master environment. And actually, at the end, I'll show, show you that. Um, but then for each of these, it does um, one machine. These are simple commands. It does one machine for the master and then for each slave. And you can actually get fancy. You can say that you want your Hadoop master to have 8 gig of RAM and uh, your Hadoop slave to all be one gig of RAM because you know they're just little workers and they don't need to be as beefy. You're going to scale out. So, uh, but but uh, we are working on our next version of Juju which allows you to do uh, co-location so that you can put a whole bunch of things on one node to use uh, resources more efficiently. So, um, but th th there's another problem <coughs> is that as services change over their lifetime, you need to be able to manage them more effectively. And you have a whole bunch of different questions, um, you know, like like how many instances. Let's let's take a, our, our Hadoop example again. Uh, you start out, you built this really simple, small Hadoop cluster, um, and your boss comes up to you and says, "We need more units. How do you add those <coughs> units? At the end of that run, how do you get rid of those units?" Um, and before it would be, you'd have to have someone go and delete them, or someone go and add more units, and it, you you just don't have this elasticity. Um, the question is, what services do they depend on? Um, how can you make it so that um, if you have your LAMP stack, that your LAMP stack has the right services? Um, and the question is, is, how are those implemented? What Juju says is, well, that's all not really all that important. Um, because what we're going to do is there's going to be high-level interfaces that um, describe the interaction between the services. Uh, a great example is there's a DB interface, a database interface. Um, and you can say that you need a, a database interface, a generic one, and then require the, um, the charm to be able to understand how to talk to them. Um, but they have provides and requires interfaces. 
And Juju models the relationships between the services and not the machines, and that's the, the most important thing. A charm is what, what I was saying is DevOps distilled. It's reusable, codified, best practices, um, and uh, the communication happens between the interfaces. And the best part is it doesn't require foreknowledge of who's actually going to use it or how they will use them. All you have to, uh, all the charm does <coughs> is basically describes it. And the set, this seems foundationally different than what we're used to. Um, and so here's, here's a logical model. So let's say that you have MySQL and WordPress. Really common, easy setup. And the logical model is that you have a relationship between MySQL and WordPress. You don't care, what you'll notice here is that you don't care how many WordPress installations you have. In the concrete model, what we do is we, we see that in MySQL, which is represented by this relationship, Juju comes along and makes sure that the, both WordPresses are actually connected to the MySQL database. Um, and then, you know, as I talk about scaling, scaling is kind of important. Um, this would be how you scale out a unit. Just simply say, I want another Hadoop slave. Maybe you want another one? You have another one. If you wanted to add 10, you could do a dash N10 and scale out 10. And what Juju will do is as these new units come on board, it sees that the uh, Hadoop master, we have a relationship to the Hadoop master with the Hadoop slave, it will then simply add these as part of the relationship so that the scaling happens seamlessly. You don't have to go back and rerun that command. Are the charms open source? Like yes, they are. Everybody makes them. There's probably some big repository of everything. Yep. And, and I'll show that to you. Um, and in, in fact, um, if you're anybody who's interested in kicking the tires, we're, uh, we'll mail you a T-shirt if you submit a charm. If you like free swag. Um, so the um, important thing is that you do, uh, it, it basically um, treats services as atomic units. We like to call them as atoms. Um, and they are formulas that can be instantiated either one time or many times. That doesn't matter, and what it do does is it handles all the getting everything all done. So um, what you'll see here is like in a very simple thing, we have a cloud app. Maybe your cloud app is, is, is super awesome, it doesn't really matter, and we need to add another one, and we can just keep adding more and more. That doesn't matter. But then um, you know you uh, you have decided to run a Super Bowl commercial, and your cloud app is just getting absolutely hammered, or you're expecting to get hammered, and so um, you can provide dependencies um, so that maybe what you can do is you can put a load balancer in front of those, um, and as you scale, um, you maybe you decide you need to actually have a, a SQL database, you know, because that's really what people do, um, and um, now you need an HA proxy to help because you have a whole bunch of load balancers. Um, and maybe your MySQL database is getting hammered, and you can just simply add more and more. Um, and the other interesting thing is, like, let's say that HA proxy isn't working for you. You can swap it out, or just rip it out, and we'll add varnish in front of it instead. So you can get some caching services. And that's what the, the beauty about um, Juju is, that it handles, the charms handle all of those relationships for you so that when it, at the end of the day you can choose the best one that works for you without you having to go in and rip it all out. And so, no, um, I'm getting skeptical looks. And, uh, <laughs> and uh, it's magic. It's magic. magic. And, and, um, the, uh, uh, and the reason I'm kind of rushing through this is I'm going to show it to you in a GUI form uh, uh, in just a minute here, um, which shows you that, uh, which will actually show the creation, will actually create a couple services. Um, so, um, moving on. Um, so basically, it, it handles, you know, like I said, it handles these relationships. It's elastic. Um, as you add new units and as you remove units, it will actually handle the relationships. So that, like, let's say, for example, you have a, a bunch of MySQL servers and you need to rip a couple of them out because you aren't using them. So you remove those units. Juju will then make sure that the relationships are properly set up so that you don't lose your data or that you don't end up uh, in a situation with a broken service. And so you can see that you know, here we scale, you know, you know, we can take one away, maybe we add some more SQL servers, add another varnish on top of that. And 
we end up basically there. So now, um, so it's a uh, the so one of the things um, here is that we actually have what we call the Juju charms. These are all charms that you can go to today, um, JujuCharms.com, um, and these are peer-reviewed um, charms. Uh, these are all open source. They're, uh, you can go today and start playing with them and use them, um, and you can do, do, do deployments. You can do everything from, and I kind of wish the OpenStack guys were around here, um, but if you look at Mark Shuttleworth's uh, OpenStack demo, uh, I think it was two years ago, we deployed on bare metal OpenStack using Juju and what we call Moz, which is metal as a service. Um, and it was um, uh, using Juju, you can uh, deploy everything from the Swift um, backend, so that you've got a place to store your files, the Glant server, Keystone, Nova Compute, the Compute nodes, all that can be done through Juju. Um, which is, is um, if you have the hardware to do it, you can do a complete deployment in under about, uh, it's about a half hour to have a fully working OpenStack, production grade OpenStack running. Um, but you know. And those charms are available in the Yeah, they are. Um, uh, one of the things about Canonic was we love to give away stuff for free. Um, and so uh, we actually. Um, we're, we're, we're having an initiative to make sure that we improve the charms and make the charms usable for everybody. Um, and uh, so, you know, you can go in here and look at them, and you'll see that there's some notable ones in here, like we have everything from, and I'll make this bigger, uh, you know, like let's say that you, uh, um, Firefox Sync Server is the one that I wrote. Let's say you're paranoid and you want to be able to give everybody a place to uh, synchronize their data, you can deploy the Sync Service. Or uh, maybe you want to run uh, you know, we got everything from HA Proxy, Jenkins, um, you know, the, a LAMP stack. Uh, you know, basically we have some um, some big ones. Even like uh, you know, down on the bottom, we have uh, uh, you know, uh, Redis. And, uh, so there's over a hundred of them here. And one of the ones that we have like that is, you know, for your Minecraft people, we have Minecraft server charm, so that when you want to get together with your buddies, you can just simply run a Minecraft server for them. All right, so that's all nice and everything. We also have a GUI. And this kind of is where things get a little bit magical. So you'll see here that I have WordPress, I have Varnish, I have a couple MySQL set up with slave relationships. Um, I have either Pad Light, and I'm a Jenkins guy. I like Jenkins a lot. Um, it's what I use to build the cloud images. So with a simple one, um, normally, um, and I'll start, let's start a deployment here in the back end. Um, and we have, you know, the, the different charms. Let's say, let's look over our charm, oops, sorry, charm list here. Um, the most simple charm there is, is the Ubuntu charm. Ubuntu. And, let's see, is it going to cooperate? Probably not. Sorry, the, um, there we go. And so we can go here and deploy, and confirm. And what I, uh, what you can see in the back end here, this is my logs, it's going out and it is creating a new instance of Ubuntu Charm is nothing more than an SSH session. Or uh, not SSH, it just brings up a vanilla instance. And when it's yellow, it's currently deploying. And when EC2 comes back, um, when it checks in, it'll turn white. Um, and if it goes bad, it goes red. Um, but you know that's nothing, not not, not too interesting. Let's uh, let's take a look here at my my Jenkins instance. And I have this as it's coming up. Um, so one of the things about Jenkins, how many of you guys have used Jenkins at all? Continuous integration. All that. Yeah, you know, Jenkins is simple. It's easy. I love it. It makes my life wonderful. Sends me emails that I don't like. Um, but one of the things is like, let's say that you need to throw up a, a quick Jenkins. Instance. You can do a Juju deployment Jenkins. But then you, there's also this other one over here, which is a Jenkins slave. Um, normally, when you do a Jenkins thing, you got to, you know, you can go ahead, fire up an instance, create the SSH connection, so that you can do a Jenkins slave over SSH, or you have to go and install the the client. But there's an easier way. 
with building the relationship with the GUI, I go like that. And now I just gotta wait for things to settle. And I'll go back to my logs here just because I like, I like looking at them. And you'll see that if something goes wrong, you'll see it actually gets set here. And so I see that my slave has been added. And I can go back over to my Jenkins thing, and what do you know? I have, you know, the, if you look on the left side, I just have right there, I have a new Jenkins slave. So if my Jenkins thing, let's say that Jenkins is not working all that well, and um, I need more, more nodes, I can go here, I can add five new nodes. And you'll see it go, goes off. It's now working on creating a bunch of new notes for me. And um, I can go back here, and I can see that I have um, in the little thing, there's a bunch of notes uh, that are being deployed. And I'm, so I'm spending my employer's money, so um, that's why I can just fire off five notes all at once. Um, but, um, you know, uh, as it's kind of going off doing that, maybe like WordPress. Maybe something a little bit more magical. Um, so we have, um, let's say that uh, um, you want to set up WordPress. And I'm going to go ahead and I'm going to connect WordPress to MySQL. Normally, when you set up WordPress and tell it to talk to MySQL, you got to go in, you got to create a, a database user, create a table for it, create ACLs. What this charm does for you is it goes through and does all that. And then in the back end, it passes that information to the WordPress charm and says, here's your database credentials. Um, and so as that's doing, uh, doing it, I think it might now have settled, because it takes it a second. Um, now, uh, obviously, as it's doing all this stuff, there's, there is the one big concern, like, how do we make sure that it's, you know, it's all stable? Like, how do, we, how do we know that someone's not gonna go in and do it? If we look at our WordPress charm, here, it, uh, you'll see that it's uh, not exposed publicly, meaning people can't hit it. So if I want to make it public, I go ahead and click that. And now I can go back here. I can see um, that it started in EC2. I can see that I'm on port 80. And I can go created my database connection. So now it's uh, now it's failing on me. So now you can watch me fix it. Now we know it's real, not just smoke and mirrors. <laughs> yeah, it, well, I, you know, I, I, I chose not to do the demo mode. <laughs> and uh, it's, it's, uh, well, that's embarrassing. Is your database, so can you, I guess, you know, like you did with WordPress, where you turned that on and it got publicly available, and about your MySQL database, do you do the same thing to that? Yes, you can. And is that, that would be causing an issue right now? Um, no, it's it's probably because things didn't settle, um, and that's what I'm looking at right here. So it, it's not as you know magical as that it you know takes just a, a you know a, a few seconds or something, but like. You know what, I'm just going to throw it away because it's faster. So now, like, what you can see here is a bunch of different ones. You can say what you're going to front it with. Let me create my sequel. Press go on, and I'm going to go ahead and because I'm costing a bunch of money and I'm not using it, I'm going to delete that service. And now I guess what you'll see is uh, you know, there's a whole bunch of stuff going on here in the back end. I mean, 
you'll see that my Jenkins nodes are currently in the middle of um, you know, doing whatever their configuration is. Um, and I can go here and I can actually look to see what's going on with their status, that they're, they're pending. Um, I have one that just started, which means that when I go back over here, he's currently offline. I have a new Jenkins slate that just checked in. And all these guys are started, which means that my Jenkins nodes, right now, I have uh, three, four checked in, but their agents haven't started. They just started. We have one more here. And um, part, part of the reason why they're kind of going on and offline is because of uh, what ends up happening is they, um, they, they do a couple start and stop. So I've just created a five node Jenkins instance with a click of a couple buttons. All right, going back to my WordPress, WordPress is installed. So now what I'm going to do, create that relationship there. So you can see that obviously there's a lot of, a lot of output I promise it was working all this morning. Mm -hmm. That's because it hasn't finished the database yet. <coughs> So any, any questions thus far? This is not working for us. So I guess if you're a life cycle of these charms to go through in terms of certification and validation. Yes, there is. Because this, this is so powerful, it can, it can either do good things real quick or do a lot of bad things. Mm -hmm. uh, yes, and that, that is that is the, uh, the, the big concern, is, is charm quality is something that we are constantly talking about. Um, much like um, uh, every distribution out there does something to control the quality of the commit. Um, so we have a, a group of people who are trusted charmers and charm reviews. Um, and part of that, those charm reviews is making sure that, um, that there's nothing malicious going on, best practices are being followed, and um, basically give people um, a second set of eyes to, to take a look at it. All right, maybe I have my database now. OpenStack, yeah, it has native OpenStack, HP Cloud, um, and EC2. Okay. We are currently working with it, um, uh, Windows Azure uh, to bring it there, um, and um, we are engaging a couple other clouds we can't talk about to bring it there as well. So okay. there's, there's, we have the goal to bring it to every cloud, um, and uh, there are people who are working to bring, to bring this from not just Ubuntu, but to uh, CentOS and Red Hat. Someone did port it to SUSE. I don't know if they made it public yet or not. All right. So now that I just threw this all away, I'm going to 
go bootstrap, so you get to see this nice and live. And what the, the way that this is done is through an environments YAML file. It basically describes my uh, cloud environment, and so I can do um, do a GG status. And what the destroy environment did was it basically just gutted everything, took it all, threw it all away. There's nothing left from it. And the bootstrap creates a new node, and that new node is going to, um, once it finally lands, and I'm going to deploy, as soon as it hits, I'm going to go ahead and create a new GUI environment. So another thing too is that when you make charms, there must be a standard for who the administrator user is for certain things of MySQL. No, that's the beauty. Okay. You don't care. Um, when I make a charm for my own application, do I care? Like how oh. is this? Oh, so there's a lot more magic going on. Yep. So so let me show let me show you a charm real fast while this is here. So there's different events or hooks which, are, which happen, and when you create a, a database relationship, it has what's called a database relation changed. And what happens is that um, uh, the one that creates the relationship is required to send over certain keys. Okay. Um, and one of them is the host, the database, the user, and the password. And so what the, uh, on the other side, when uh, we go ahead and we click that link, between the two. And my SQL guy says, okay, so I need, I need to create a new user, and it goes ahead and, and like I said, it creates the user password, the, the table, sets the ACLs, and then it simply sends them over to this guy and says, no, you got to do what you're going to do with it. So um, in some cases, what you'll see down here is like where there's the configuration that happens in the uh, UR, URI. And then the application creates its tables because it has everything set up. And one of the cool things that Juju is doing here in the, in the back end is it's a plugging everything together for you. Um, so that if you have uh, like a, you know, a ACLs that you getting set up um, on the network level, um, the, you know, like EC2 for example can allow you to set uh, ACLs, it will set those ACLs um, as part of that process. Because you're creating a relationship and saying, okay, you're creating a relationship, I'll make sure those two can talk. So that's part of the magic that's going on. That's what I, what I meant by you don't have to worry about things um, like you used to. Um, and then, like, if we go and you can, and that's the, the beauty about these things is that they're so, um, that they're open source. If I go down to the MySQL chart where you see that there's all these different relationships here, and um, what the uh, corresponding one is on relationship joined, and it goes through and read basically what happens and see if like, it does a grant and whatnot. But the thing about these charms is that they can be written in, and notice my Firefox sync was written in Bash. This is written in Python. Um, if there are ones that are written in PHP, um, you get Python, someone decided to write one in Go, you can write them in CSH if it really suits your fancy. The thing about the charm is that uh, it's about distilling the operational knowledge so if you, whatever is the most comfortable is what you can write it in. As long as you have a shebang for it, <coughs> Juju is happy with it. All right, so my guy is up now. And now I'm going to do a deploy of this guy here. And this sets up the GUI. Now what you'll notice here is that um, Juju is a command line tool, but we have a charm, which is the Juju GUI, and the GUI, and so the two are, are a little bit different. Um, but what this does now is I have everything set up, so I'll go Juju deploy um, WordPress, and it goes out, and which you'll, if you notice there, it says it's going to the charm store, um, and those are the approved charms. And let's say that um, you wrote your own magic. You do deploy dash dash repository equals and local foodbar. And you can deploy your 
uh, local terms. So you don't have to just use what we have. You can use your magic, which means that in your operational environments, where maybe you have taken thousands, you have all these scripts uh, about how to describe, and maybe do deployments, set up databases, you can use those and use them locally. And you can actually even set it up so that you can um, use them against a local Git installation too. So, uh, you know, it, we're, we're wanting to make it so that everybody can basically get done what they need to get done. And I'll do deploy my SQL. So the reason I'm showing you the command line now is that um, the beauty about the command line is it's scriptable um, so that you can create environments. And there's actually a, another really cool thing is that Juju can drive Juju. Um, there's a charm out there of Juju creating a Juju environment for the purpose of doing automated testing. So it'll go out and create a Juju sub-environment, then let you do your testing, aggregate all those results back, throw away that other environment. Um, so you can do nested environments as well. And then um, I can do a Juju status, and I should have my GUI back. I need a password. And it isn't actually ready yet, so. Seems like we really leapfrogged a lot there. Yeah, th this, this technology is, is ahead of the game. There's not many many people who are even remotely close to this sort of concept. And it takes a while for you to wrap your head around it. Um, and I mean, it's, it's, it's one of those things where when I first saw this, my first question was, I'm a guy who likes to get the nuts and bolts. And it scared me that there, you could take a database and hook it up to uh, uh, you know, WordPress, and you didn't know what was going on. That that. That was like this is black magic, and that's the reason why part of the reason we got named Juju was we wanted to say that it's we're taking care of all that stuff for you. Um, all right, let's see if our environment's back up, and you'll see that you know with the different ones we have um, the pending stuff, um, and so looks to me as if Amazon is being slow. Um, but uh, in terms of this, this technology, there we go, now we're starting to get public addresses. Um, it means that my instances are taking a well. while. It looks like Amazon doesn't like the fact that I just fired a bunch of instances today. Um, one of the things that, uh, uh, when I said that it works as metal as a service, which is a way to be able to do local deployments, you can run this uh, against bare metal things, you can run this against OpenStack. Um, HP Cloud works right now, um, and you can you basically just, in your environment's YAML file, you can, um, which is basically just the YAML description. You can say that you want multiple environments. And so, like, I have another one. Um, oops, sure. um, Canonical has their own internal version, and um, I just created a new environment on another cloud with that command, just by telling it to look at Canonical. It almost seemed like we're swinging back to time sharing in a way. If that means anything. To you. Yeah, yeah. Well, the, the thing the thing about it is, is that one of the things with the cloud is that um, you know, in, in, in you know 10, 20 years ago, um, you would um, if you built a database server, you go out and buy the hardware, and then you know you run it, you install it, and you hire some guy to administer it. The cloud says that you don't need to do all that. Um, maybe you want to run your own cloud. Uh, maybe you want to pay Amazon to do it for you, or Microsoft. You can get um, hosting things. Or maybe um, you don't want to have to bring in, if you think about it, if, if you have a moderately popular website, running it in your basement isn't an option. You've got to choose somewhere else to run it. You've got to run fiber. You've got to get some bandwidth. You, um, then maybe you got to get enterprise networking gear, and the cloud basically says, we can do all that for you, and we'll take all the all that gear and basically abstract it completely away from, from you so you don't have to worry about it. And what Juju is, is saying is that um, because um, basically the traditional data centers um, have been abstracted, they're no longer relevant, um, you know, they're, they're out there, people can use what they want, 
but you should be able to go to where you need to run it, right? where it makes sense. So if you were to, to, to compare like HP Cloud to Amazon, they have different services, but some of those services may not be attractive to you, maybe you want to get stuck up on price. Like, uh, for example, if you want a really, really fast server, HP Cloud is blazing fast compared to EC2. Um, if you want uh, a, um, a really awesome object store, you probably will want to go to Amazon or uh, Windows Azure. So what Juju is, is kind of, the idea behind Juju is that the cloud exists and you should be able to move between vendors based on your needs. And so um, that's why I fired up a, another instance where I said, um, you know, I wanted to go against an OpenStack installation uh, because uh, uh, you can just simply decide that, um, that uh, maybe you aren't getting the performance you want Amazon's not paying attention, you go over to HP, or Bluehost opens up and you want to hit their APIs directly, you can go to Bluehost. It, it's basically, you get to choose where you run your data, and uh, Juju will help you do it so that you don't have to tear down that vendor lock-in of building your entire infrastructure. You don't have to worry about it. You can, t you can basically go over from one cloud over to this other cloud that's going to pay more attention, maybe they give you better discount, uh, build everything, copy your data, and you're done. In a matter of minutes, what used to take a couple of days, can take you know, 10 minutes to get it done. And it's really commodity services. Right. That, that, that's exactly what it is. Um, I'm sure on an infinitely capable machine. So, so what, what are some of the next problems to solve? And now we, this seems like a lot of the system administration that we finally will be taken care of. Mm -hmm. Then we really need to start you know our brain power on solving some of the other problems, you know, be it, you know, medical diagnostics or, you know, news based systems. Or well, one, one, the part of the reason that we um, we, we we started Juju was because um, we realized that the cloud is has scale. It's, it's a big promise. The ability to um, build a whole bunch of discrete services across, um, you know, uh, you, where you might have one well, discrete service maybe have like. A thousand nodes you need to run, or you need to run. Well, I'll take 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 for example. Um, uh, last April, and I don't know how many of you guys are drinkers. Um, I'm guessing not very many. Um, so forgive the analogy um, or uh, the story. Um, but last April, um, uh, someone came up and said, "How big of a uh, uh, this is the the GUI just came up. So um, how how many nodes can Juju handle?" And we said. Workers did um, is uh, uh, he, he open source conferences. If you go to enough of them, there's plenty of drinkers. And he was in a bar, and he said, "Can you call up Amazon? Tell them we need 2,000 notes." And I said, "Okay." So we give them a call, tell them we're going to do 2,000. They say, "Okay, fine. Do it this time." And uh, he started in the bar with uh, with a couple of us. And um, as we sat there throughout the night, um, because uh, uh, Juju was fast. He deployed a Hadoop master, and then in batches of 100, started up Hadoop slaves. Um, added them to the master using a script. And by the end of, by the time Amazon was done provisioning, Amazon was the bottom. It took Amazon four hours to provision that. And can you imagine how many beers one can enjoy over four hours? Um, by the time the, the provisioning was done, and he was completely sloshed, he managed to uh, uh, finish building the cluster, Run the benchmark, and tear it down, um, and then go and, uh, back to the hotel room. Next morning, he didn't remember doing all that stuff. He just looked at the data. So when you can think about a, a deployment technology that allows a drunk guy to um, operate a Hadoop cluster using simple commands is pretty, pretty impressive. So uh, you know, it's, it's, it, um, we, we've done some other things like. Um, with our, with, you know, like with WordPress, but um, we've done like MediaWiki has been completely charmed, so you can run your own MediaWiki um, thing. Just simply throw it up um, and uh, 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 and do your, your relationships. You can do uh, Hadoop. I um, mean, we've got a lot of them. And the thing that we're we're asking is, we actually have. If you look over, I look at the charm queue.
this is, um, we do it since we're canonical, we do everything in Launchpad. Um, and these are terms needed. And you'll see that, like, for example, Cloud Foundry is, uh, uh, just looks like the fix got committed, it's not fixed released. Um, and then, you know, people have filed different bugs. People want, like, Gluster, which um, I believe is done, so shared file systems. If you want to, let's say you want to play with the new hotness of uh, object store, um, you could do Ceph. Um, do a, a complete deployment of Ceph across um, the different nodes. And the Ceph charm, for example, um, which is, is kind of cool, um, uses the ephemeral storage located on instant store nodes inside of EC2 to pool all the storage together. And then basically now you have um, your own private object store that you can use. It handles all of the balancing, all that stuff for you. So anyway, it looks like, like we're running out of time. So questions, comments, echoes? Um, I, I apologize that the demo fell, fell apart on me. Uh, that's rather embarrassing. Um, Very good presentation. Thank you. Um, but uh, what you guys can do is, um, like I said, we're looking for people to do new charming. So if you guys want to um, keep the tires on it, we're in free node on um, Pound Juju. Um, and um, we want to, if you have some pet project that you want to, that you're, you find that you do all the time, um, if you want to charm it up and, and run it, we send t-shirts to everybody who submits a charm. Um, so if you want to, want to get one of those. And, um, the best, uh, the most important thing is, is that we want to see our community grow. We want to see the, the knowledge that everybody here has um, distilled so that uh, other people in the open source world can uh, apply it. Does, does this technology kind of uh, eliminate the need for some of these projects that, that used to go on and may still go on where people are giving their free time off their, their servers or their desktops and so on? Some of these big analytical projects. I mean, it seemed like this might. Be. Yeah, it, the the idea was to help them. Um, uh, one of the um, one of the, the ideas that we actually were, were trying to, to float is that uh, if you can, the the reason why there's all those projects for giving free time is because building a 2,000 node cluster is so difficult, um, or even building a 10,000 node cluster is so difficult. It takes a lot of time. It takes a lot of expertise. Um, and what this would allow researchers to be able to do is to efficiently utilize the time um, so that you're paying for um, what, what might have cost them, you know, let's say, 20000 to set up in a month, they can now do for under, I think, 4000 Our Our 2000 node test cost us $2,500 um, to set it up. Um, and it was, uh, you know, it, it would rent for, I think, we rent for three hours, um, which is not a bad price tag in this site. So, uh, for scientific computing, um, that's actually why the new charm got written. Um, we had some, some friends uh, uh, over in Europe who um, were doing some important discoveries and needed to do some, some number crunching, and so they asked us to help out. Dante's been real successful. I've used it for, I don't know, 10 years or more, whatever it is. <laughs> yeah. So, um, and you know, since I'm the cloud image guy, if you guys see any problems with the cloud images, feel free to. Uh, come hunt me down. Um, I like to hear get feedback from our users. So with that, thank you, gentlemen.